Uh, Dr. Noel holds a PhD from Penn State University, a Master's of Science from MIT, a B. Arc from Howard University, and a Diploma in Civil Engineering from Trinidad and Tobago. She has been a researcher and educator at Georgia Tech, Penn State, the Singapore University of Technology and Design, and MIT, and has practiced as an architect in the US, India, and Trinidad and Tobago. So without further ado, I'd love to give Vernelle Noel a warm welcome and uh, we'll sit back and enjoy her talk, The Mathematics of Wirebending. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Sabeta. Uh, all right, let me share my screen now. So I can see my screen, right? Good. Yeah, all right, nice. Okay. So because of the, uh, you know, the program, I was excited to use it with mathematics, right? Um, in my presentation, and I look forward to um, hearing from you all and the wonderful discussions that we'll have after this, right? So I, this is what I want to share with you today. Um, as Sabeta mentioned in my research, my work, I look into traditional craft ways of making as well as digital and automated practices and how these things intersect with society, right? Um, and so just, I always ask the question or lay it on the table so that we're all clear when I talk about computational design, all it means is I'll using algorithms, systems, rule-based approaches to analyzing design, creating design or making design, right? It might include or it might not include digital technologies and the computer. And so I started off with the question of shape and what we call shapes. And I say we as designers. So you all as mathematicians, you all are gonna tell me something different, right? So I look forward to that discussion. Um, but how we think of shapes as these elements in space, they could be points, lines, solids, et cetera, but they have size, they have position, and we can speak to or describe them around coordinate systems. So we know what shapes are, right? Uh, and in computational design, we may add shapes, subtract, transform shapes. And within the language of geometry and how we use geometry in design, there's translations, there's rotation, reflection, glide reflection, and many more I might learn from you all, scaling, etc. cetera. That's two-dimensional, not to mention three-dimensional transformations that we might um, carry out on shapes, right? And one of the sort of foundation computational methods in my field is that of shape grammars developed by George Steiny and James Gibbs, um, both mathematicians. No, Steiny was a mathematician, Gibbs was, I think, a computer scientist. Um, and it's a way of calculating design with shapes. Like I mentioned, you can use it to analyze design, describe design, create design. And what I will share with you today is how I'm using uh, an approach to the mathematics of shapes to document a particular dying craft practice, which you all know is wire bending. Right, and shape grammars consist of rules and steps. So rules that describe operations with left hand, right hand side, and computations, meaning documenting of one's steps. So I'll, before going into wire bending, I must give you the context in which this craft sits, because without the context, uh, the importance of the craft does not uh, does not hit home, right? And so it starts here with the Trinidad Carnival. Many of you might be familiar with Carnival. If you're not, I hope to introduce you to it. Um, but the Trinidad Carnival is about creativity and innovation. So French planters introduced Carnival to Trinidad in the 1780s. And although Africans, because we had slavery in Trinidad, and so although Africans engaged in Carnival festivities during their enslavement, after slavery was abolished in 1834, 
they reinvented the carnival to express their creativity, their freedom, their aesthetic sensibilities, and to claim their humanity in the face of a system that considered them less than human, right? While for Europeans, carnival was about fun and frolic, for those of African descent, it was religion. It was a form of psychological release of tensions and uh, from domination, segregation, these violent systems of control. This is an engraving from 1888 of carnival celebrations in the capital city of Port of Spain. And when I use the term Trinidad Carnival, it doesn't define its geographic location, but instead its origin and the main elements that define the carnival. The three elements the defining the Trinidad Carnival are one, mass or masquerade, that's the design part, calypso or soca, which is our music or rhythms, and the steel pan, which was invented in Trinidad and Tobago in the 1930s by the African working class from discarded oil drums. And this carnival has spread to more than 70, you know, countries, regions around the world in the US, the UK, Canada, to name a few, and uh, other Caribbean islands. So carnival is a space of joy, creativity, celebration, education. I, I often think of our carnival, especially um, in the past as our internet of the time. This is an image of George Bailey's um, presentation. He called Back to Africa in 1957. And this sort of public engagement in uh, making and designing these costumes, public education by spectators being part of this presentation, uh, storytelling of biblical futures, real past, real histories, imagined futures, all of this took place in Carnival. We also have innovations, additional innovations, I should say, happening in Carnival. This is in 1984, Peter Minchel and his band Kalaloo where here he introduced the use of fiberglass rods inserted into fabric to create what we will call textile hybrid costuming. But in addition to the creativity, it has a form of, uh, of this, this site of innovation. It's also about community. It's about making together, expressing creativity together and celebrating together. At mass camps, which are the places that people make costuming, perform, test how these uh, costumes behave, um, choreograph dances, et cetera, sing. Um, people come together to make, there are feelings of interactions and family closeness, feelings of family bonding and friendship while people design, make, cook, eat, drink, right? Listen to music, all of these things happening in shared spaces and within competitions because it's, it's highly competitive, but all of this takes place within that frame of competition. Uh, there's mentoring and cooperation with people uh, mentioning feeling wanted and secure in these spaces, being taught how to respect the arts and respect the artists, right? Having the ability at, to ask for advice with problems that they may be having. And it's also about engagement. Although design and making in Carnival is of itself a form of community engagement, all of the wirebenders I spoke with, including designers, they um, most, if not all, initiated and organized events in their communities. So Mother's Day events, Father's Day events, football competitions, as they said, to keep their community together. So all of these elements are intertwined in the history and practices of making in the culture of Trinidad Carnival. In addition to costumes that I showed earlier, we also have these large structures that are decorated and performed in the carnival. Uh, we call them kings and queens of carnival. I call them dancing sculptures so that I could define them, right? Um, and one of the craft practices integral to the design and fabrication of these artifacts, these large architectures you see here, is the craft of wire bending. Wire bending began in the 1930s in Carnival, and in it, wire, fiberglass rods, cane, 
linear rod materials are bent and shaped to create these large structures for performance. Um, these large structures often express um, they may tell stories of society, politics, the environment, you name it. And they are expressions of creativity, innovation, and technical skill. This is an image of Stephen Derrick, a wirebender who has since passed away, but this is an image of him performing that craft of wirebending. Historically, this is a photo from 1969. Historically, wirebending is a male-dominated practice, um, which figures in the, the way I treat um, entree into the practice, let's say, right? And so my interrogation into carnival began because I was noticing these aesthetic changes happening uh, in our carnival. And one of the things I found out during this time was the disappearance or the impending disappearance of this particular craft. And this disappearance, if it were to disappear, then it is a sign of all that I've shown before disappearing. So a loss of history, heritage, community engagement, mentoring and cooperation, all of this is tied to the craft and tied to people's creativity, their innovation and their fight for freedom. Some of the issues uh, occurring in the craft and other crafts around the world include little to no documentation of the practice as many times craft is tacit and unwritten and taught by these lengthy apprenticeships. Two, a slow transmission of these knowledges. Three, dying practitioners. I've so far lost four um, of my informants since I started the study and changing practices happening due to you know, global and technological changes. But this is important because this craft is embedded in historical, social, and political frames. Its disappearance signals the erasure of histories, of celebration, resistance against oppression, and more. Two, because its knowledge is tied to practitioners so that when they pass away, they take that knowledge with them making it even more difficult, more challenging to pass this culture and pass this knowledge on to others. And three, because research has shown a strong link between the quality of one's craftsmanship and its relationship to one's ties to society. So good craftsmanship, strong ties to a community. Weak, weak craftsmanship, weaker ties to a community. So now, when it comes to how I use, let's say, shape grammars, what I showed you before to attempt to unpack this mathematics of wire bending, I developed uh, the Bailey Direct Grammar. It's a computational tool to document, to aid in documenting and transmitting wire bending knowledge. I'll show you how I'm using shapes to document this dying practice. So this is another image of Stephen Derrick performing wire bending. And part of this process involved working with them, observing what they were doing, taking many photos, sketches, et cetera. Um, but these are beginning drawings of my documenting of the ways that they were connecting materials, the materials that were being used. And I would use these things to ask questions of why certain moves were being made, right? And further development of it included sort of finding a vocabulary, categorizing the materials that were being used, cap categorizing or using symbols, operations, and rules to describe what was happening, spatial relations um, that was happening within this craft to make this tacit embodied knowledge in wire bending explicit. On the left is Stephen Derrick. On the right, my sort of analytical categorizing uh, representations of the technical nature, technical knowledge of the practice. And so this involved developing a vocabulary for the practice based on uh, what I saw at the site, what was being used, and developing rules for how certain connections um, were to be made, the materials that were being used, parameters that would be involved in the practice. So the grammar has about 50 something steps and it continues to grow. So it, 
There is no stopping to it because as I learn and change and test certain things, it continues to grow. These are more images of some of the rules describing the craft of wire bending, and I'll show you some more of it. Um, it also describes steps, so how one goes about making certain connections within the craft. This way, by it being explicit, this could be shared with others. This is an example of a particular rule, the steps involved in making that rule. And here I show an on-site image of uh, that particular connection uh, that wire benders made. This is another image showing a particular step in that craft, him hammering the end of an, of an aluminum rod and above the step which shows uh, how that happens, right? The beginning shape, what we start with, and the ending shape. Another example here of another connection and the steps involved in making that particular connection using aluminum rods. And so the Bailey Derrick grammar, which I named after Albert Bailey and Stephen Derrick, it computationally describes technical knowledge in wire bending. It's a series of drawings that describe the materials, the steps, and the techniques in wire bending, allowing for analysis, transmission of this expertise for education and practice. This is Albert Bailey and Stephen Derrick, who I named the, gra the grammar after. This is an example of how it can be used to externalize knowledge so that these, these rules are less tied to practitioners, seeing that they are passing away and retiring from the practice. It facilitates documentation and a recording of the design and making process and sheds light on the computational dimensions of the practice, opening it up for further inquiry. So after developing the grammar, yes, I you know, made this thing that I could hypothesize that it, this is how it might work, but we want to test it, right? So I conducted workshops to test on the ground, really, what happens when this grammar is deployed. So I had workshops, and in the workshop, um, they would be in teams of three or four. It was done with art students and art teachers. Um, and in the first round of it, they would make something using uh, wire bending materials, and they would have to communicate that to another team without them seeing the artifact. And in the second rounds, I would teach them the grammar, and then we would do it again so that we could compare the before and after. So this involved teaching them sort of the theory or the technical knowledge behind the craft, um, how the materials were used, why connections were made, etc. Then I would spend time teaching them the practical, so how to bend, how to hold tools, etc., to make their connections. We would practice for a bit. Uh, this is them using the grammar. And before using the grammar, there were conflicting standards and instructions. So this is their reporting on what was happening before. They felt a lack of knowledge or understanding what was happening. There was poor craftsmanship, as you can see in the images, missing information, and feelings of a lack of confidence of, of what they might do. However, after learning the grammar, there was now an agreed standard for communication. Craftsmanship improved. They were able to replicate artifacts, and there was an increased confidence in what they might do using wire bending. Uh, in these images, the artifact on the left is the original, the artifact on the right, a copy using only the grammar or their notes, and we see that replication is happening. So that was great. But one of the coolest things happening from this was this new collaborative approach to the craft. So currently, wire bending, because we don't have many wire benders, it's one person to one or many artifacts, right? But because we now had the grammar, multiple people could participate in making this artifact or artifact, but they could collaborate in, the, in this particular craft. It reinforces the thoughts of mentoring and cooperation with people being able to engage by documentation, analysis, fabrication, assembly. This collaborative approach to the craft was very, very appealing to participants. So now, in addition to the grammar, 
um, develop ways that we might introduce computers and other forms of technology into the craft. The craft is male dominated, like I mentioned, and currently there's no space or place for those who might be techno conscious or interested in digital fabrication to participate. So I wanted to open up a space for women, children, physically infamed, those who are missing from their practice to be able to engage. So I developed three ways, including the Billy Derek Grammar way, that people might, others might participate. So the second way of crafting fabrication uses uh, a CNC wire bender and design, digital design software. Digital crafting involves digital design and fabrication software that I developed, 3D printing, um, as well as all that they could before, right? So these new ways of engaging. Uh, these are images of, so I did this as a class at Georgia Tech. These are images of some of the artifacts that students were, were able to make. So this is using the Bailey Derrick Grammar and Hand Tools. Here using CNC machine, the grammar and hand tools. And here using speculative software for design, fabrication, and everything uh, that I showed you before, right? So these different ways of making artifacts using linear rod materials. More images of some of the works that students were able to make. Um, and so through this project, it was important that uh, we demonstrate that students could learn computation, mathematical thinking, computational thinking, uh, designing with shapes, calculating shapes through this craft of wire bending and vice versa. They could learn wire bending through these computational approaches to the craft. As an architect, you have to test this at the architectural scale. And so we wanted to, we built a pavilion because we wanted to find out what wire bending techniques might be able to tell us about architecture and vice versa. So based on that grammar that I showed previously, because we now had this abstract description, we could play with different spatial relations of possible connections and tectonics and test them structurally. So test their performance, how they would behave under compression, under tension, et cetera. But new languages became possible because of this grammar. This is an image of the pavilion that we made. This is another image of it. And here are some images of, or some drawings of new rules that resulted from that experiment. From building that pavilion, we were able to learn new things to create additional rules for the grammar. So it continues to grow, like I mentioned. Uh, and then we also explored using it in active bending structures and active bending structures are structures that use the behavior of materials to make design. This, uh, the image I showed on the left, that's an example of an active bending structure, fiberglass rods and how they behave with, with, uh, with textiles. They are able to shape and form themselves. And so pulling from that and the structure of the previous pavilion, we made another one because we had to enter lightweight structures competition in Barcelona, Spain. So uh, here are my students and I making, we made several scaled prototypes of uh, these fiberglass structures that were made out of large circles that we folded and twisted. Uh, on the right, that there we are installing our pavilion in Barcelona. On the left, that's our entire pavilion coiled up in a drum case, which made it convenient for transport because we had to fly from the US to Spain with our structure. This is a picture of, um, of our finished sort of experiment of the structure. And what we wanted to achieve with this project was bringing traditional crafts, cultural practices, visual computation, how we can broaden the design space, how we could uplift low-tech uh, cultural practices and open up our field for 
participation by people, cultures, and knowledges that are currently missing. So our pro project sought to integrate structure, material, and culture so that they're all considered concurrently. And when it comes to my personal explorations with the craft, as I continue to practice it, um, these are images of some of the artifacts that I've made. Sharing this one, these with you, a few of them with you. And I love lines in every way. And so apart from the artifact, what I really love are their interactions with light and shadow, right? So on the right, on the left is the artifact, on the right, my exploration of their interactions with light and shadow. More images here. Uh, this is uh, the structure for a boat that Sabeta will know well, um, that we made for an exhibition. On the left, the structure for the boat. On the right, it after it's been sort of the skin has been placed on it. Uh, this is a sculpture that I did recently for an exhibition. Um, I call this We Are Invisible. It was, it's supposed to speak to sort of violence and gender-based violence in our society. And in addition to making these artifacts, I have made speculative software that allows me to engage with the craft in different ways. Um, and these are drawings um, that have been pr produced based on using that software, which re-describes surfaces using lines. These are the images of that. Okay. All right. Um, and I think that's it pretty much. Just sharing with you how this one in, uh, investigation into this dying practice, different ways of creating multiple representations and ways of engaging with it, not only for practice, but for education and how we educate multiple uh, publics uh, with this craft. All right, so I thank you very much. Absolutely beautiful talk, Brunel. Um, I guess we should open the floor up to questions. Um, there's so much to think about. Uh, so I guess if you have your hand raised, um, please, or please just unmute yourself and jump right in. So you're an anthropologist too. I would not say so, but I use some tools. Yes, I do. Yes, <laughs> yes. Sorry, my, my wife, who is sick of math talks, is an anthropologist. So, ah, okay. so she would have loved this okay, um, okay. in addition to me loving it, obviously. <laughs> OK, good. Yes. Uh, I have a quick question, which is, I think, you know, you, you, I, first of all, I just want to say thank you for a spectacular talk. Uh, it was really amazing, really inspiring. Um, I wonder if you could sort of, your discussion reminded me of the context of various practices of making being dismissed as, as, as technological or as uh, innovative because of various either raced or gendered norms, right? They're, not, they're being done by people who don't look like the people we associate with creating technology mm -hmm. um, or creating, you know, and I was just wondering if you wanted to speak to that context. I know Sabetta has done work in these contexts as well, thinking about different practices that are uh, not recognized as mathematics or not recognized as computation because of this. And so I was just wondering, you know, that seemed like a thread running through this. And I wonder if you want to just elaborate on that. Sure, absolutely. So, um... The name of my lab is after a framework I've developed in particular for my field, but I, you know, I believe its application runs beyond my field and generally for research, um, which is around, you know what, let me pull it up, hold on. 
Hold on, I'll answer your question. Let me just pull this up for you. Give me one second. Good thing about having a million different slides in your slide deck. Give me one second. All right, here we go. Let me just share quickly. All right, you're seeing this? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, and I call what I call this situated computations. Let me just pull the entire screen. And it's an, an approach to my field, which um, definitely privileges certain people and knowledges. Um, but it asks that we ground our tools or technologies or methods, et cetera, in the social world by acknowledging the historical, cultural, and material context of our field of designing and making, that would include mathematics. And it responds to our settings, social and technological infrastructures, and refuses to remain ignorant of social and political structures that shape them. And currently it involves the eight principles, right? Um, but that has been a guiding um, sort of framework for that has resulted from the works that I have done and to situate my future approaches to how I engage with my field uh, and the, the communities that I engage with. Um, does that answer your question, Chayada? It, it, it does, and it, it, it leads to a lot of different thinking. Thank you for the for those slides. And, and will you will it be possible to share these slides with us? Uh, um, I, I think so. Thank you. Thank you. So. Thank yeah. you. Okay, you're welcome. We have one question from chat that is, can you please explain what visual computation is? Thanks, Chad. Um, really, all it is is computing, computing with shapes, and it is it does privilege the visual, all right? Because as designers, like we're looking for uh, we're creating shapes, we're looking for embedding what we perceive um, and how we use, how shapes intersect, et cetera. Um, so it's really computing with the things that we see, really, that's what it is. That, and it doesn't need computers. Pen and paper, you could do visual computing. I hope that answered your question. Just calculating with shapes. I, I had a I had a question. You you uh, you showed the um, uh, the the the, the so somebody reproducing uh, a work from the instructions, the the grammar that you developed, mm -hmm. um, and you showed sort of the um, like individual steps. Mm -hmm. uh, do you do you have like you know uh, the the whole? What does it look like the the instructions to produce one of those works? Is it I am, I'm imagining something like instructions for making origami or something. Does, can, you, can you share something like that? Good question. Um, so there usually consists of shapes and words, right? So it's not just shapes. Like we could make another round and probably it'd be all around shapes, but usually it's shapes and words to make things clearer. Um, I did, did not have any of that in my slides. What I did show you was my computations for making an object and for parts that are pretty repetitive, you know, just use dot, 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 you kind of get the point. Um, but yeah, for me, the, that description, those instructions, I find it beautiful, um, but they take so much time. But I do, I do love them. I do love them. But they do take time. Yeah. Just there's one quick follow on from the previous question that didn't make it in chat before the second question got asked. So um, she's also asking, um, and what is speculative software? Okay, good question. So the speculative software, which I didn't really get to, it's a tool that I scripted, right? Um, using Python in Rhino, so in Rhino script, to explore from Rhino new ways that we might represent lines and use lines in design. So all it is, it's a tool that I developed, um, and that in addition to being used for design and fabrication, 
the output of that is what I also play with to produce the drawing. So it's speculative in that it's not, it's something I'm playing with and creating on the fly. Uh, Remy has his hand up. Yeah, hi, thank you very much for the talk. Um, I had a question. So you describe a set of rules and you explain us how it can be used to transmit knowledge. But sometimes also you can use rules to create new patterns, like when you use cellular automatum or certain fractals like L system, those kind of things. So if that is something you explore from your rules, try to generate uh, new shapes that people would not have thought of. Absolutely. Yes, Remy. So if I had more time today, what I wanted to do was sort of explore those, you know, scale, rotate, all of these different operations and what different spatial relations would occur for you all. I didn't get around to that. However, in the pavilion, those new tectonics I showed you, all of those would, because we had these new rules, how might we change these rules using different operations to test what some possibilities for tectonics might be. So yes, you are right. There's another question in chat. Would there be any way to incorporate the use of fabrics in the grammar as well? So my answer would be yes, because the answer is always yes, right? But I feel like it would be something different because the grammar is specific to, let's say this state of the grammar is specific to linear rod connections. And when it comes to using fabric and planes, right? That is an entirely different sort of structural description, right? So structurally in my mind, they are two different things that can emerge from the wire bending part of it, um, it would just be different. I hope you, you know what I mean, right? It's different materials. They perform differently. Planes behave differently from lines. Um, so that's the thought that's happening in my mind around the use of fabric. I would say um, additional geometry could be an entirely different parameter, whether you're using planes and lines, you're using planes alone, you're using planes and planes, you're using planes and solids, like all of those explorations could be had for sure. Another question in chat. You spoke about how Trinidad Carnival has spread to other parts of the world. Have you looked uh, if and how wire bending has spread and or evolved with the spreading? So there are other types of wire bending. So I've seen wire bending from Mexico and I see just seen, meaning I saw an artifact. Then another friend bought for me um, wire bend artifacts from Uganda, I believe. They make these amazing toys, helicopters and cars using wire and their descriptions are different. My description is specific to the Trinidad Carnival. It's, I've only had the resources to explore that because research costs money. Um, and so I have not had the resources to explore wire bending in these other regions, honestly. Yeah. There's a question from Glenn Whitney as well. If He's still around. Uh, yeah, I'm here. Uh, yes, thank you so much for sharing you know, so much food for thought and so much beauty. Uh, I was specifically wondering when I saw the pieces that you had done where you incorporated some uh, 3D um, printing. Uh, I saw, for example, it looked like a hexagonal or a six-way junction mm -hmm. where wires could come in and, mm -hmm. and be held in place by the by a, by a 3D printed mm -hmm. uh, uh, component. I was curious whether you'd had the opportunity to take some of these items, some of these, the, the new components and show them, share them with traditional practitioners of the craft to get the reaction like, oh, what have you done? This is not wire bending or, oh, wow, I wish I had that 30, like, have you gotten that kind of uh, back and forth? Yeah, so yes and no. So the grammar I took back, like, 
it's it's really important of repatriating these knowledges, right? So the grammar I've been able to take back to the wirebenders and the reception has been, oh, this is great. Um, some have even said, oh, I, I, I know how I could use this. Like this could help me even in my practice, right? Um, and they understood it, right? I haven't had the opportunity to test it with them. I, I tested it with um, students and teachers and this is just time and everything as the realities of underground research, right? Um, but regard to the 3D printed part, I haven't gotten, again, resources to be able to test that in the context of Trinidad and Tobago. However, that particular way of engaging with the practice was the least favorite of my students. And they said that it was because they no longer had the opportunity to manipulate material and improvise with the materials and how they behaved, it felt like I made this thing, I put them together and that's it. So it took away from the experiential nature of the practice. How I do intend to use them though, I, I want to have another experiment with that. When things open up, hopefully I'm able to do that. But I, I do have an idea for how I want to use those 3D printed parts when it comes to tectonics and wire bending. Uh, we have another question in chat. Um, or actually, we've got a couple, but uh, the first one was, uh, did wire bending evolve from basket weaving? I don't think so. Um, maybe a, an answer is I do not know, but I don't think so, because it's not necessarily woven. It's more creating a framework um, for decoration, etc. So my answer would be no, but you know, craftspeople see things and get ideas. Right. There's another question. Did you have any issues with people using the grammar? Could the use of this grammar be a replacement for the traditional apprenticeship, apprenticeships to get into the craft? I love this question. I get it all the time and I love this question every time. So the, it, my, my answering of it, it depends on it's value and what is valued, right? So the, the main problem at this time is that this craft is dying. With this dying craft, the important things that are being lost are communities coming to make together, histories being lost, these opportunities for mentoring and cooperation. So it's beyond the actual thing that's being made, right? It's not about the thing, it's about what the thing facilitates. Right? It's not about the product, it's about what the grammar and being able to work together facilitates. So someone else might make an artifact, but it's not about the artifact is the point, right? Um, if, if communities are becoming defragmented and these rich social things are, are disappearing, that's the important part. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's my answer to the question. It's not about the thing, but what they think facilitates, which are these social interactions and sharing of histories and knowledges and community. Rebecca has her hand up. Hi, uh, I was wondering, um, seeing the pictures of the dancing sculptures and then the wire bending, um, would it be fair to call a lot of the wire bending sort of armatures that um, other things get attached to? Yes, I would say yes. Armatures that things get attached to um, movement, right? Depending on how they attach, they allow movement, rotation of, of certain parts, etc. cetera. Um, and another part of my desire for the practice is that we are able to have different aesthetics where the craft itself is the thing that can stand out, right? So if we were to remove the decorations, like there is an opportunity to showcase those beautiful tectonics that are happening in the craft. Um, but I would say, yes, armature to some degree. Um, although in the lightweight pavilion that I showed, right, we had no skin on that, that in of itself to answer the fabric question, that was a whole, that took time to figure out and we just couldn't figure it out. So, um, but how that material behaves with textiles, um, 
think that's another question to right? continue figuring out. Uh, I just want to mention Jayadev. I saw, you know, Brian Lara. Yes, he's uh, one of my favorite cricketers. Too. My, my favorite cricketer of all time. <laughs> and speaking of art, art, artists, artists in technical disciplines, right? I mean, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. yes. <laughs> all right, we've got a couple more questions in chat. So mm -hmm. one is a follow up to the previous questions. Have you followed how your tools have impacted the wire bending crafting community? Have you seen more women becoming involved? Have you noticed a bit of a revival in the community? Um, thanks for, for that question. So there is no real community because of the dying of practitioners and we don't have a system for passing on the knowledge in schools or anything, right? Um, however, in the um, course, in actually the two workshops I had and the class that I taught, it was majority uh, women participants, right? Women and females. Um, and so I think that's a good sign for um, how it opens up different, um, different ways of participating and who participates. So I can't speak to Trinidad itself because that that culture is the thing I'm trying to address, that we, we are losing that culture. We have people who bend, but we don't have a system for creating a culture of wire bending. Um, so that's my answer to your question. Uh, there's another question. Have wire and fiberglass always been used since the beginning, or did the practice start with other materials? Good question. So fiberglass was a new introduction, I feel in the 1980s, um, because fiberglass is like an industrial made material. So before we would use wire, we would use cane or reeds, right? Because Carnival is all about using affordable, easy at hand materials. And in the 1980s, Peter Minchel introduced fiberglass rods in his costuming, and that was uh, used by other wire benders as, oh, this is another linear rod material. It has behavior. How might we use this in wire bending? So I have sort of a two part question for you. So I guess the first part is about. Um, I guess like the sort of commutivity of the steps in your grammar, like how much is there like a time component to it? And then I guess the second question is, um, I guess, uh, so Glenn often leads these large scale builds, um, which require oftentimes people to make like small units and then join them together into something big. So um, I was, I guess the question then would be if there isn't too much time dependence to the process, can you build sort of community out of making like large sculptures where everyone participates? I think that sounds like a great idea. Yeah, because, you know, we have these rules and whether we choose rules or people choose rules and materials, um, we could communicate how or what we're making. I think for sure that could be done. Um, to your first question about time when it comes to documenting the rules um, or the steps that it takes for, I think some steps could be made shorter, right? If, they're, if they are repetitive. Um, but that speaks to how we document our heritage because we do not do a good job of documenting our heritage. And that's just a matter of resources that we have space, time and all these things. But being able to document our heritage to learn from it, create new innovations from it and, and have those for passing knowledge on is important. And this is why, um, that role of documentation is another way that people can participate in the craft. So I might not engage in wire bending, but I could be the one who documents the steps as we go along, right? So um, I can't speak to the exact time. I can't give you an estimate because it might vary, 
on the connections and how things are done, but. Thank you. Um, are there more questions? I haven't seen anything come in chat in the last couple of minutes, but if there's anyone else who has a question, feel free to unmute yourself and ask. I heard that um, Linux doesn't have a hands up button, so please just jump right in. We've got about five minutes left, so if we have like one or two more questions, that'd be perfect. I'm curious a little bit about the role of sort of experimentation in the grammar and, and whether it sort of facilitates it. Because it seems like the kind of thing where very small changes at the local level could like really change the overall structure. And so does like, is that sort of the kind of experimentation that this sort of speculative software allowed one to do? Or, or really, is it something that you want to build a bunch of different ways and see what happens? Yeah, so just having the grammar give people the feeling of freedom to explore what possibilities might be because they, they had a starting point and they could try different ways. Um, the software, the way I, I'm thinking of using it, like I mentioned, I'll test that out, but the software students found constraining. It did not give them the freedom when it comes to the material part of the practice, the actual making, like they enjoyed the act of manipulating materials and improvising. They felt that the two um, constrained them, but I want to explore ways of uh, breaking that up a little bit so that it, it feels or it, we test it being uh, something that also gives freedom. So those, those are the, the two lesson, learning lessons a little bit so far. A couple more questions from chat. Um, one, uh, could you explain what the word tectonics means? Ah, good question. So tectonics, let me switch my architectural writing memory palace. When we say tectonics in architecture, what we mean are how materials come together. So a tectonic could be the different ways that people install bricks, right? Um, and a sort of argument I'm making with this, the pavilion that I showed you is one of tectonics that are that celebrate specific contexts and regions. So when I say tectonics here, all I mean is how these different materials come together so that we could build structures. So that's that's what tectonics means. Thank you. Um, the other question is, can you talk more about the boat? So the boat, so which part of the boat? So, so, so Beta who contacted me, um, this is with regarding to math and alchemy, right? Uh, and an exhibition and they wanted a boat built for part of that exhibition. And it was the first time I built something that was not small, but was not big, it was kind of a medium size. Um, and bending with, with wire, it's, it's quite a feat um, because it's lines. It's not like a plane that gives you some structure. It's a line that could go out of alignment. It's, it's, it's interesting. Um, but yeah, I used, there I used CNC uh, machine to bend certain curves the best way I can. Um, and using the materials in wire bending, which is primarily uh, tape that's used to keep wires together and materials together. And then we had to skin the boat, Sabeta and I spoke about it. Sabeta and I, Sabeta talk about leather. We picked this, what I think is the most beautiful color in the world to skin it. Um, and it ended up being sort of weaving a leather skin around that structure but that's the boat, it's currently being exhibited. One last question. Um, is that CNC wire bender a commercial product or a homebrew? It's a commercial product. It's built by, built by Pensa Lab, P-E-N-S-A, Pensa Lab. Yeah, and they have two times. They have a cheaper one, which is 4,000 something, 
and the more expensive one, which is 20 something thousand dollars. I guess I'll ask a quick follow on how much um, of your students uh, work is the practice of them bending the wires with their hands since you said they really like the interaction and how much of it is using the computational tools which you seem to say they didn't like so much. Yeah, so the the first each each process lasted about a week, um, so the first two processes, let's say, included bending my hand, because what the machine does, it helps with the thicker and harder, harder wires, right? So it helps with the, when it comes to the labor intensive part there. So that is still hands-on. Um, so yeah, two thirds of their learning process and the pavilion was all, no, we had no 3D printing or anything for the pavilion. It was all using hand or the CNC wire bender. Um, so my students now have very strong wrists and hands. Yeah. Oh. This has been absolutely incredible. Uh, thank you for your talk and all of your insight into the melding of uh, these sort of technological grammar, like the, the construct of it with the culture of it. And I, I think that's a lesson that we in mathematics should not forget as well. So you've been a fantastic um, example for us and we should take more of your ideas to heart. Thank you, Vernal. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so I guess for everyone else, we have a 15 minute break and then we have uh, the next show and ask session. Um, so I guess for those of you who don't know, it's uh, basically a session where uh, participants uh, show an object and sort of ask questions about it or about their product process and the audience will also ask questions. So um, please join us for that. It is in Dave Bachman's workshop link, which uh, hopefully someone will post in the chat. And if not, I can do that in a minute. Um, but I guess everyone should get up, stretch, get a glass of water, and then come back. But thank you so much, Vernal. That was fascinating. Thank you. Have a lovely